What does the cross mean to you? You know, the cross means different things to different people. For many, uh, it's only a symbol worn for decoration around the neck. But for those who lived during the time of Christ and even before, and death by crucifixion actually began about 500 years before Christ uh, came into the world. It was actually started by the Persians. And then, of course, the Romans developed the practice and continued to uh, actually work with execution by crucifixion to even develop it uh, according to their own desires as far as the... Uh, the uh, excruciating pain and the torture that would go along with it. But for those who obeyed the gospel of Christ after the ascension of Christ and the beginning of the church, the cross uh, meant something very, very different. I want you to look, if you will, to Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. He said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The cross of Christ represents the power of God. God's power to save the soul from sin. And Paul wrote in Galatians 6 and verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You know what Paul says, God forbid that I should glory. God forbid that I should glory based upon my own accomplishments. Based upon what I've been able to achieve, even for the cause of Christ. Paul did not want any glory for that. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, By the grace of God I am what I am. And he understood that everything that he was able to do, and everything that he had become after his conversion to Christ was because of the grace of God. But what he gloried in was the cause of Christ, was the cross of Christ. And what the cross meant to him. And what the cross meant to every other Christian. And what the cross would even come to mean to, the, to those who were not members of the body of Christ. Just think about that for the next few moments. What does the cross of Christ <coughs> reveal? That's what we're going to be studying for the next few moments this evening. First of all, the cross of Christ reveals the love of God. I do not believe that an individual can truly look at the cross of our Savior, think about what happened on that cross and what Christ did on that cross, without coming to a realization that the love of God was surely involved. To understand something about what this means as far as it pertains to the love of God, you, you have to go back to almost the dawn of time. Go back to the third chapter of the book of Genesis and you'll read where man sinned. Man violated God's law. And thus man became separated from God. Many, many centuries later, to the fallen nation of Judah. The prophet Isaiah said, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. What was true with them is true with man today. What was true with them was also true with the very first couple in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. God said to the serpent there in the garden, there after the fall of man, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first glimpse, really, that you get pertaining to the love of God as far as his desire to raise man from that fallen state. You see, God was not content to leave man in, a, in that fallen state. He was not content to leave man in a state of condemnation. He wanted man to be saved. He wanted to be able to justify man. But in order for him to be able to do that, ultimately there would have to be that sacrifice on the cross. And from that time on, from Genesis 3.15, all the way through the Old Testament, you see God's plan unfolding. His plan of redemption. 
That plan that he set in motion, even there as he was speaking to the serpent, to Satan, that plan begins to unfold. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, you remember that it's in that very same, in that very context. Paul is writing of the Old Testament law, and he writes of the fact that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But he says, after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. God raised up various prophets to prophesy of the coming of Christ. Oh, you have prophets such as Isaiah and Daniel and Micah, Zechariah, and others whom God raised up to prophesy concerning certain details of the crucifixion of the Savior, of God's man, to, of God's desire, of His plan to establish a kingdom and to ultimately save man from sin. We read in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 where Paul says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. When the fullness of the time was come, there are those today who would have us to believe that the church was established as an afterthought, as a substitute. They insist that Jesus came into the world to establish His kingdom, but men rejected Jesus as king. Men would not accept that, that plan to establish a kingdom. And so God determined that He would establish the church as a substitute, as an afterthought. And that eventually, at some point in the future, the Lord will return to the earth to establish His kingdom. Only one problem with that. And that is, it's not biblical. It is not scriptural. You see, God makes no mistakes. When God determines that He's going to do something, He does it. And when Paul said, when the fullness of the time was come, that's another way of saying, when the time was right. When the time was right. And the time arrived for Christ to come into the world, for Him to be born of the Virgin Mary, for Him to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, as Luke says, and for Him to continue to grow and then at about the age of 30 to begin His ministry here upon the earth. We also read in John 3 and verse 16, one of the most familiar passages in all the Bible, where Jesus in His conversation with Nicodemus says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We also read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How could God allow His Son, His only begotten Son, to sacrifice His life on the cross? How could God allow Christ to suffer in the way that He did? How could God allow Him to suffer to the extent that He did? One word. Love. God so loved the world. And so then, the cross of Christ shows just how much God loves us. But then in the second place, the cross also reveals the blackness of sin. Yes, the cross reveals the blackness of sin. There is a need today, and that need is for man to be able to view sin as God sees it. You see, according to the weight to the world, there is an attractiveness when it comes to sin. There's that, that lust, the lust of the eye, lust of the, uh, of the flesh and the pride of life, of which Satan, of course, is the author. But we need to see sin as God sees it. Not attractive, not something to indulge in to, to enjoy the, the pleasures of the flesh, we need to see it in the way that God sees it. Look, if you will, at 2 Peter 2 and verse 22. Peter says, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. A graphic picture indeed 
But it's the picture that is being painted by the inspired apostle to show his readers what it is like in the sight of God in the immediate context for one to have come to a knowledge of the truth and then turn away from it and then go back to the ways of the world. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. James writes in James 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And John writes in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. In order to understand something about the blackness of sin and how horrible it is, you have to go back to the beginning. God created man in His image. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27. Of all of creation, man was the only part of creation that was created in the likeness of His Maker. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. You go over a couple of chapters. And you read in the third chapter of the book of Genesis where Satan leads man into sin. He approaches Eve first and begins to question her about the forbidden fruit. What has God told you? Well, she reveals to Satan what God has said. And she tells him that he's informed us, he's told us that in the day that we eat of this fruit, that will be as God's, knowing good and it. And he goes on to entice her in that way. So she looks at the fruit and she sees that it is good to the sight. It would be good to the taste and it would be desirous of making one wise. And she partakes of it. She entices her husband to do the same and he does so. And they become guilty of sin. And again, as we noted a few moments ago, Sin separates man from God. Adam and Eve were alienated from God. But in the New Testament, we read in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, God made Christ to be sin for us. Not a sinner, but sin. That sacrifice that would provide atonement. God made Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. What did it take in order for there to be the possibility of atonement for sin? It took the death of God's own Son. It took the death of the second member of the God in, in leaving the glories of heaven, assuming the form of flesh, living among men, and finally going to the cross to sacrifice His life. That tells us something about the darkness of sin. So the cross shows us just how much God hates sin. But then in the third place, the cross reveals to us something about the horror of hell. Yes, it reveals to us something about the horror of hell. The Bible teaches that all men of all time who have ever lived are going to be judged. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14, God will bring all men into judgment. We also read in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. We also read in Romans 14 and verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. But then we also read from Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31, The wicked and the righteous will appear there before the judgment seat of Christ. And it is there that the wicked and the righteous will be separated. The righteous will be ushered into the celestial city of God, into heaven, to live eternally with God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the angelic host of heaven. But then the wicked will be ushered into hell, the place of everlasting punishment, the place of darkness, a place of fire. So then inevitably, someone would ask the question, how can a loving God send anyone to that place? As if 
God is responsible for man's sins. As if God is responsible for man's rebellion to the will of God. They're overlooking one point. They're overlooking one very important point. And that is, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? That's what they're overlooking. God gave Christ. God planned to have His Son sacrificed on the cross to save us from that awful place. To save us from the place of everlasting punishment. In the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. He's not going to force His will upon man. He's not going to force anyone to accept His Word and to be obedient. But He doesn't want anyone to be lost. In the words of Peter in 2 Peter 3 and 9, For the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus revealed a great deal about the place called hell. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 48, Jesus spoke of hell, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In Matthew 25 and verse 41, He said that He'll say to those who are lost, come judgment day, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then we read in Matthew 13 and verse 42, where Jesus said, And cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And He's told us all of that. He taught that in order that man might avoid that place at all costs. In order that we might be willing and desirous of doing the will of God. In order that we would be saved eternally. But then finally, the cross of Christ reveals the glory of heaven. It reveals the glory of heaven. Let me tell you, you cannot leave this point out. Because you can't look at the cross of Christ without understanding something about, about heaven. In John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said to His disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Those words have comforted many, many people who were heart sick over the prospect of being separated from loved ones. And these words were even spoken in the context of the apostles, the disciples, considering that prospect of being separated from their Lord, from their Master. And then when He tells them, I'll come again and I'll receive you unto Myself, that must have brought joy to their hearts. It must have been a great, great source of encouragement to them. But that's not all. In Revelation 21 and verse 4, The Apostle John says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If this verse of Scripture, Revelation 21.4, were the only verse in all the Bible that tells us something about heaven in those words, that would be enough cause us to want to go there. To motivate us to want to go there. No more death. No more crying. No sorrow. Nothing, nothing whatsoever that could mar our lives. Nothing whatsoever that could mar our joy. That would be enough to motivate us to want to go there. But that's not all. Look, if you will, at John's writing again in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. 
And on the either side of the river was, the, was there the tree of life. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. This is a picture of heaven. One of them. The glory of Almighty God will lighten the city. Let me tell you something. The same glory that caused Moses' face to illuminate and to be so bright as he went back down to the children of Israel after meeting with God upon the mountain, upon Mount Sinai. And he had to put a veil over his face. That same glory will lighten the city of God. The place called heaven. Paul writes in Romans 8.18, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You know Paul suffered for the cause of his Lord. And he suffered greatly. But when he thought about those sufferings, no doubt even as he was penning these words, he thought there's no comparison. When you think about the glory that he would receive in the city of God and the reward he was willing to suffer. He was willing to endure anything that he had to endure. Knowing that heaven would be his home. To have life eternal. Never ending. Life that will go on forever and ever and ever. To be in God's celestial city. To be able to behold sights that could only cause us to stand in awe. Sights that will be more beautiful than anything that we have ever beheld in physical life. To be with God, Christ, the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the planner of the scheme of redemption. Christ, the Son, who made that scheme of redemption possible by providing Himself as that sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit who provided His Word for us in order that we could obey the Lord and in order that we could live for it. Think about actually standing before the majestic throne of God. To actually behold God, to be able to behold God on the throne. And Christ, to live eternally with the redeemed of the ages. People like Moses and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Rebecca. Men like Peter, James, and John, the other apostles of Christ. Women like Dorcas, Lydia, the redeemed of the New Testament. Those whom we have known in this life who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. And then, certainly this aspect is enough to motivate us to want to go to heaven. To once again enjoy the fellowship of loved ones from whom death has separated us. Those whom our hearts ache to see again. Those whom we long to be with again. Where embraces and hand clasps will be far warmer and sweeter than anything that we could ever imagine. To once again be with those Never again to be parted. Never again to have to say goodbye. That, brethren, is the place called heaven.
These are the things that the cross of Christ reveals to us. And as we think about the cross and the death of Christ on the cross, then we think about what man needs to do in order to be saved from sin. The Bible teaches that it is the blood of Christ that washes sin away. But note, if you will, that Paul writes in Romans 6 and verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, look at this, were baptized into His death. Jesus shed His blood in His death. And therefore, when an individual is baptized in, into the death of Christ, it is there that the blood is applied to the soul. Cleansing the soul from sin. If there's someone here who needs to obey the Gospel, we encourage you to do so tonight. If you're an erring child of God and your need is to come back home to the Lord and renew your commitment to Him, we encourage you to do that. Won't you come to Jesus as together we stand and say, There's a fountain free tis for you and me. Let us make so place to its spring. Tis a